Our goal is to determine the exact area under curves. To do this, we're going to use some notation for writing sums, which we'll introduce by example. When we write this, which we read as the sum from i equals 5 to 9 of i cubed, we mean this sum. This notation is just an abbreviation. The variable being incremented is here, in this case i. Its starting value is here, which in this case is 5, and the ending value is here, which is 9. We count up by integers starting with 5 and ending with 9, put those numbers into the expression i cubed, and then add up the resulting terms. We can use any letter that we want, but keep in mind that only the letter written below the sigma is incremented. So, for example, this expression indicates that i is being incremented, so the k doesn't change. Likewise, here the k is being incremented, so the k changes while the i stays the same. There are two properties that we'll use frequently, and should not be surprising. Since the sigma notation is just an abbreviation for addition, we can pull a constant multiple out of the sum, and we can split a sum of two terms into two separate sums. There are also three summation formulas that will be very useful for us. They allow us to write certain expressions involving sigmas as expressions without sigma. First, the sum of the first n integers is n times n plus 1 over 2. Second, the sum of the first n squares of integers is n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6. Third, the sum of the first n cubes of integers is n times n plus 1 over 2 squared. These might seem like strange choices to consider, but they'll appear frequently in our application. So let's look at a quick example of the application of these properties and formulas. Let's simplify the sum from i equals 1 to n of 4i squared minus 7i cubed. Using the two properties of sums, we can write this as two separate sums, and then pull out the 4 and negative 7. Finally, we can write this without sigmas by using the formulas for the sums of squares and cubes. Let's return now to the issue of area. We want to find the area under a curve, and the intuition is that we'll use rectangles to approximate the area, and we'll take a limit as the rectangles get narrower and narrower but we'll first need to consider less regular-looking approximations. To do this, let's introduce some terminology. A partition of the interval AB is a sequence of numbers x sub 0 through x sub n, where x sub 0 is A, and the sequence is increasing up to x sub n, which is B. The ith subinterval of a partition P is the interval from x sub i minus 1 to x sub i. And the mesh of a partition P is the width of the largest subinterval of the partition. So let's go back to this example. And we're only concerned with the partition, so neither the function nor the rectangles matter. We care only about the partition itself. It's given by these nine points. This is the sixth subinterval, for example, and this width is the mesh of the partition. We're almost ready to define a Riemann sum. We just need two more pieces of notation. First, delta x sub i is the width of the ith subinterval. We use delta to indicate change, so these delta x sub i's are the changes in the values of consecutive points in the partition. Second, c sub i denotes any point in the ith subinterval. Now for the definition. Let f be a function on a, b. A Riemann sum of f on a, b is any sum of this form for some partition of AB. Let's look at that form closely. For each i, we're evaluating f somewhere in the ith subinterval, and then multiplying it by the width of the ith subinterval. This amounts to adding areas of rectangles. Back once more to this graph. Let's choose a point in each subinterval and evaluate the function at those points. For example, here's c sub 3. And here's the point c sub 3, f of c sub 3. And this is the width of the second subinterval. So again, this sum is the sum of the areas of the rectangles. The delta x sub i's are the rectangle's widths, and the function's values at the c sub i's are the heights. 
Two of the most common types of Riemann sums are those that use the left or right endpoints of each subinterval as points to determine the height of the rectangles. In the graph on the left, the left endpoints are used, and in the graph on the right, the right endpoints are used. Although these are very common and very useful for computation, they're not the most useful conceptually. That distinction belongs to the following two types. In these graphs, we're using the minimum and maximum values of the function on each subinterval to determine the height of the rectangles. On the left, we're using the minima, and we call this the lower sum, and denote it by L sub f of p. On the right, we're using maxima, and we call this the upper sum, and denote it by u sub f of p. Notice that many of these points are endpoints of the intervals, but not all. This one, for example, isn't an endpoint, and neither is this.